Hello, this is John Tennyson. I'm going to present you a set of slides which were originally presented during my talk at the Museum of Regional History in Texarkana, Texas on Saturday, March 31st of 2018. These slides deal with the question of where the Joplin family was living as of the 1880 census. I refer to this analysis as a proximity, probability, and epidemiological analysis, and uh, you'll see why in a moment. Uh, prior to my analysis, uh, most discussions of Scott Joplin uh, discussed his family and Scott himself as if they had been living on the Arkansas side, and there was very little attention or sometimes even memory of the fact that prior to moving to the Arkansas side of Texarkana, they had in fact lived on the Texas side. However, the census taker in 1880 did not clarify with precision the exact location of the house. So what I have tried to do is come up with the best estimate of the smallest perimeter possible that I think is likely the location where the Joplin family was living at the time of the 1880 census. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, and here I say the 1880 census shows the Joplins living in Texarkana, Texas, but no street address is given. They were listed as living in dwelling 261, but that number was an arbitrary number assigned to the home or dwelling by the census taker and did not correspond to a specific street address. Um, before moving to the Arkansas side of Texarkana, um, the Joplins lived somewhere on the Texas side of Texarkana. So here is uh, evidence of that. This is from Ancestry.com. It shows Giles Joplin, the father of Scott Joplin. Um, they were living on the Texas side of Texarkana by at least as late of June 18, 1880, when the census was taken. Uh, the census taker coded the Joplin family as living in dwelling number 261, and um, the houses, the dwelling houses, were numbered in the order of visitation. So that means that in general, it's fairly safe to assume that dwelling 260 was adjacent to dwelling 261, and in turn, dwelling 261 could be reasonably assumed to be adjacent to dwelling 262. Um, that's not always the case, but in general, those are reasonable assumptions. It doesn't necessarily mean that those three numbered dwellings would have been on the same street, but they would have been in some uh, path where one number was next to the other number. Okay, so if you take a closer look at the Joplin family on the 1880 census, um, it's kind of hard to see because it's somewhat small here, but you can see where the family of Giles Joplin starts. And if I enlarge that, you see uh, the number 261, and uh, you also see Giles Joplin uh, and the other people of the family, uh, of, the, of the Joplin family. And I have an arrow put by Scott. Giles, as you can see, was listed as a common laborer. Florence, his wife, was listed as under uh, her employment was wash and iron, and Scott was listed as, quote, going to school. There's also another family listed as dwelling number 265, and this proved to be interesting. Uh, this family, of course, would have expected to have been four doors down or four dwellings away from the structure in which the Joplins were living. Uh, this was the family of Dr. William Riley Rooks and his wife Mary and his daughter who lived at this structure. Uh, Dr. Rooks was a very prominent doctor at the time in Texarkana. And if you look at the 1899 directory of Texarkana, interestingly, the widow of Dr. William Riley Rooks, that's Mary J. Rooks, was listed as living at a residence at 803 Pine. Given the socioeconomic status of most physicians and their families, um, it seems less likely that the widow would have moved from whatever structure they were living in at the time that Dr. Rooks died. So although I don't have proof, my analysis is going on the working assumption that this residence at 803 Pine was the same residence that was listed as dwelling 265 in the 1880 census. Okay, there's another family, which is the McCullough family. And as you can see, they were listed as living and dwelling 262, which would have meant 
they were most likely directly adjacent to the Joplin family. James McCullough was a blacksmith, and uh, the uh, dwelling 262 uh, can, would generally be expected to be in between dwelling 261, where the Joplins lived, and dwelling 265, where Dr. Rooks and his family lived. Okay, now interestingly, if you look at the famous three-dimensional 1888 map of Texarkana, there is a structure in this block uh, near current day 803 Pine, uh, which looks like it could have been a blacksmith shop. Perhaps it was James McCullough's blacksmith shop. I don't know, but I don't find evidence for James McCullough having had a blacksmith shop at any particular location and this particular structure and its components do have elements which we have come to associate with blacksmith shops. So, for example, if you see a smokestack with a guy wire and a square facade, if you look back at the picture, um, all of those features are present. And here's another example of a blacksmith shop with the square facade and the smokestack. Here's another. This is actually a railroad modeling kit, but it captures some of the quintessential features that have come to be associated with blacksmith shops. A raised ventilated roof, um, a smokestack, as well as the guy wires. Okay, here's another example. The raised ventilated roof at the crest of a lower uh, roof, uh, and then also the square facade. Okay, and you know, the themes continue. The, the raised ventilated roof, the square facade. Okay, so once again, here's that 1888 three-dimensional map where you see this structure which includes what appears to be a square facade, a raised ventilated roof at the crest and the lower roof, a smokestack with a uh, guy wire or guy wires, and also a, what appears to be a water tank outside that structure. So this is possibly a blacksmith shop and possibly James McCullough's blacksmith shop. Okay, so um, there's also another blacksmith, Caleb T. Motts, who was a blacksmith and wagon maker who was listed at living at 804 Pine Street in the 1899 directory. However, Mott's place of work was also listed as 301 West 3rd in 1899. So it might have been, even though he was also a blacksmith, that he might not have been affiliated with any previous structures associated with blacksmithing on the block in which he lived. But that was another interesting correlation. Okay, another interesting thing, this is why I call this an epidemiological analysis, is that there were a total of 17 cases of measles in the 1880 Texarkana, Texas census. All of these cases were among black families. And the households in which these cases of measles occurred, uh, I think, provide some insight. As you know, probably, measles is very contagious. So, for example, here, here are the... Um, all 17 cases. This is from Dwelling 148, page 15. This is George Garrett, a black male, age 35, head of household. He works on a farm. His wife is Adelaide. She is engaged in washing and ironing. They have three sons, Albert, John, and Bob. Albert, age 12, has measles. Okay, I can't find any additional information on this family in the 1899 directory or 1900 census and it's not clear how this family might have been near the others with measles in 1880, but to be inclusive and comprehensive, I did want to include them. And this listing occurs on page 15 of the census. Okay, here's dwelling 292 on page 28. Uh, this is Teal Green, a black male, age 23, head of household, works at a brickyard. That brickyard could be uh, insightful. His wife is Nellie, age 18, who is engaged in washing. Their son is Saul, probably Solomon, six months old, and he has measles. I cannot find any additional information on this family in the 1899 directory or 1900 census, but their dwelling of 292 is likely to be near the dwellings on page 29 of the census, where there are 15 cases of measles, and where dwelling 260 has 11 cases of measles spreading over three families, one of which is headed by Alan Price, who also worked at the brickyard. Dwelling 260, possibly a large structure, housed 17 people spread over four families, all black, and Dwelling 260 was likely to be directly adjacent to the Joplin house, which was Dwelling 261. Okay, so here's page 29. Okay, so you can see the Joplin family at the arrows down below. Uh, there are 15 cases of measles 
on this page, 11 cases in a dwelling which is adjacent to the Joplin house, and three cases of measles in the Joplin house, where, which are the low, lowest three arrows in the bottom right-hand corner. And then the other uh, cases are above that. Okay, and uh, also, as I said, Mr. Price also worked at the brickyard. So the brickyard potentially could have been a locus where measles were being contracted uh, or possibly transmitted uh, after having been contracted elsewhere. Okay, so if you put this all together, um, you can see at the very top balloon, I label where uh, Dr. Rook's um, wife was living in 1899. By the way, Dr. Rook's died October 23rd, 1896, just you know, three years, probably less than three years from which the directory was uh, published. So my best estimate is that he was living at that same location um, where his wife was in 1899. So his widow, Mary J. Rooks, was living there at, at where the arrow points at 803 Pine Street in 1899. And if this is the location where the Rooks family also lived in 1880, which was dwelling 265 in the census, then the, this location can be estimated to be four houses away from where the Joplins lived in 1880, which was dwelling 261. Now, you don't necess necessarily know where those four houses you know, coming eastward, westward, northward, or southward. Um, but I have other data that suggests that probably that was four houses to the east. Okay, I've also mentioned a couple of associations with the brickyard. The only known brickyard at this time was the one which was a W.E. Varner's brickyard. You can see it labeled in the upper right-hand corner of this picture. It existed at least as early as 1880, and 12 of the 17 cases of measles on the 1880 census occurred in dwellings with an inhabitant who worked here at the brickyard. And as I said, 11 cases were in a dwelling adjacent to the Joplin house, and three cases were actually in the Joplin house. So um, there is a possibility that the brickyard uh, has an association with the spread of measles, and it's certainly, in terms of estimating which direction from the Rook's house, the Joplin's house, might have been, um, putting that in the direction of eastward movement towards the brickyard seems to be a better estimate than assuming that the census taker was coming from the west. But you, you can't say for sure, but th that's a, a better estimate based on the available information. And of course, I have an arrow there showing what the commuting distance uh, to the uh, Varner uh, brickyard would have been. Uh, I have the location of the Orr School label on this map just for your interest. Um, that doesn't directly relate to this analysis, however, of where the Joplins were living in the 1880 census. Um, I also have labeled on this map the location of where prof the music teacher, Professor John C. Johnson, lived um, at 816 Wood uh, by no later than 1899. It does appear he might not have lived there at the time the 1880 census was taken, however. It's not clear, though. Um, also, the location of the AME Church which is very close uh, to where the Joplins lived once they moved to the Texarkana, Arkansas side, is, is located. It's been said that Joplin might have been a, a choir director at a, a local African-American church. This is the oldest church, uh, at least in Texarkana, Arkansas, uh, the, the oldest African-American church of which I know, So, and it's also literally in Scott Joplin's backyard, so to speak. So I think this is the best candidate for a church for which he could have been the choir director. And there are also newspaper articles which document uh, very good vocal performances by members of the congregation. So this church did have a strong tradition of uh, vocal music that was so good that it was covered in the local newspaper. I also have 618 Hazel Street labeled. This is on the Arkansas side. And this is the location of the Joplin House after they moved to Texarkana, Arkansas, sometime after 1880. Okay, and then, and then the main focus, really, of this slide is what I'm going to say now. That's the block that's been circled in red. Um, this is the block that has the structure which has features in common with a blacksmith shop and uh, also for which McCullough, it, you know, McCullough is, his household is, uh, structure was uh, adjacent to the Joplin's and it, therefore Joplin might have lived on this same block. In fact, that block is, if I have to circle a single block and say, what's my best estimate of a single block in Texarkana on which the Joplins lived, it would be this block which is circled in red. Okay, so it, this is a 
um, this is a Sanborn map. So I have to, it's kind of an aerial photo in which um, some of those same locations are labeled. Some additional locations are also labeled. Uh, but I have a red dot, the big, the larger of the two red dots. I say this is my best estimate for the block on which the Joplin family uh, was living as of the 1880 census. And then I also have uh, 816 Wood labeled, which is the house where the African-American music teacher John C. Johnson resided. I also have 809 Laurel labeled. This is the address where the African-American music teacher Maggie or Mag Washington resided. And then the smaller red circle is the location that the Joplins live after they moved to the Arkansas site and is believed to be the best single location to associate with a uh, boyhood home where Scott Joplin would have resided for most of his time after moving to Texarkana, Arkansas. Um, also, I have the uh, 709 Hazel address located. This is the Wilder House. It's not known absolutely that Joplin played on that piano. However, it's very likely that he did. It's very plausible that he did, and it's uh, likely to be very similar uh, to pianos that he might have played on at locations where his mother worked. I also have uh, the prior claim about a piano that Joplin played in, in a house where his mother worked, and that was at 521 Hazel. Uh, this is the address of the Cook House, where Gene Cook, in a 1959 interview, said that Scott Joplin played the piano while Scott's mother cleaned the house. That was the first claim of that type of, of arrangement. It was only later uh, that the claim was made for the house, the Wilder House at 709 Hazel. But given the proximity to the Wilder House, to the Joplin address at 618 Hazel, it's quite likely that that uh, Florence Joplin had a similar arrangement and that Scott could, could very well have played the piano at 709 Hazel. I also have uh, labeled the 514 East 4th Street address. This is the address where the German music teacher John Klimt resided. Um, it has been theorized that John Klimt might have been the German teacher that Lottie Joplin uh, claimed Scott had. I will say for the record, and I want to be very clear about this, that there is no proof what's, or evidence whatsoever that Julius Weiss was Scott Joplin's piano teacher. It's possible that he was, um, but the proof for it, the evidence for it, is limited, and, and we certainly it should not assume or jump to the conclusion that Julius Weiss was one of Scott Joplin's piano teachers, although it's plausible uh, that he was. Julius Weiss lived at the Rogers House, which is at the lower left-hand corner of this map at 221 Maple. Uh, that's also, by the way, where Joseph Deutschman lived. They were both boarders in that house. Um, if you consider the two locations where the Joplin family lived, the 618 Hazel and most likely the block uh, that I've encircled in red, the big circle in here, neither one of those is proximal uh, to 221 Maple. And it, it is also the case that there were various other uh, black women besides Florence who cleaned houses and ironed and, and did that type of work. So to imagine that she was working, that she lived uh, um, at one of the two locations where the red dots are located and yet somehow was employed over at the Rogers house uh, would be unusual because those are not really, there, there would be a lot of need and demand for employment for the type of work she did much closer to where she lived. So it's, it doesn't seem likely uh, that she worked for the Rogers family. Certainly we don't have evidence that she worked for the Rogers family. That's, that's all been presumption based on the assumption that Julius Weiss might have been Scott Joplin's piano teacher. Uh, so once again, we have no proof or evidence that Florence Joplin ever worked for the Rogers family. Okay, and so the red perimeter encircles my best estimate for the block in Texarkana, Texas, on which the Joplin family lived during the 1880 census and prior to moving to Texarkana, Arkansas. If you look at a modern aerial map, that same red perimeter, you can see it here, encircles my best estimate for the block uh, where the Joplin family lived during the 1880 census and prior to moving to 618 Hazel uh, in Texarkana, Arkansas. By the way, there is no house structure there at 618 Hazel anymore. Uh, there's just a, um, I believe it's a, some uh, basketball courts, a recreational area there. But there is enough space there at 618 Hazel where if the city of Texarkana, Texas, and or Arkansas wanted to put a memorial there, uh, they certainly could, could manage that. And by the way, the red perimeter block that I've encircled um, 
there half of that block is a parking lot and then that's the eastern half and then the western half has uh, some structures on it but that block would also uh, be amenable to a Joplin memorial of some sort um, so so that's it so that's basically the set of slides that I presented on March 31st 2018 at the Museum of Regional History in Texarkana Texas that deal with my best estimate of where the Joplin family was living in 1880. I am certainly open to anyone else's thoughts or theories or ideas about where the Joplin family could have been living in Texarkana, Texas at the time of the 1880 census, but for now, this is the best estimate of that. I wish I could be more specific than a single block, but knowing that they appeared to live four doors down from the Rooks family uh, makes me want to include the whole block uh, rather than something that would in involve a smaller perimeter. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation of these slides and my discussion. In time, I will put up all of the slides from my presentation, which was originally on March 31st, 2018 at the Museum of Regional History in Texarkana. Thank you.